Last video, I presented the theorems of Gauss, Green, and Stokes. There are many ways to use these theorems. In this video, I want to show the most direct uses of the theorems, and I'll do this by example. So, here is a vector field in R3. The surface I want to consider is a tilted triangle in R3 with vertices 3, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, and 0, 0, 1. The normal points upward at an angle. The curve is the boundary of this triangle, which is three line segments, and the direction of the curve is counterclockwise around the triangle viewed from above to match the orientations. The triangle is part of the plane x over 3 plus y over 2 plus z equals 1, and feel free to check that all three points are indeed on this plane. That means that the normal to the triangle can just be the normal to the plane, and this is nice because it saves me from parameterization since all I need for the flux integral is that normal. Then say I want to know the line integral around the edge of this triangle of the field. This curve is a closed curve, and Stokes' theorem applies when I have a line integral of a closed curve, since that's the left side of Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem that says that this is the same as the flux integral of the curl over the surface. You see, I don't really want to parameterize all three sides of the triangle. It's not too difficult, but it is pretty tedious. So instead of doing three tedious line integrals, Stokes' theorem turns them into this one pretty nice flux integral. So I calculate the curl. In this case, the curl is also a lot simpler than the original field. To do the flux integral, I need the dot product of the curl with the normal. So here's the normal from the last page. The dot product of the field with the normal here is zero, which is even better, because that means the flux integral, which is the integral of the field dot the normal, is zero. It's just the integral of zero over the whole region. And then going back from Stokes' theorem, it tells me that that original line integral is also zero. So let me recap, since this is all about strategy. The original fundamental theorem was a way to calculate integrals, and all these new versions of the fundamental theorem are the same. They show how to find easier ways to calculate certain integrals. Here, I had a doable but quite annoying line integral. However, since it was over a closed curve, I could apply Stokes. Stokes needs a closed curve on the left. Then to do the integral, I need a surface which had that curve at its boundary, and in this case it was the triangle. And I needed to calculate the curl of the field. Everything worked out really well here. The curl was an easier field, the normal to the surface was easy to find, and the dot product turned out to be zero, which made the flux integral trivial. None of this is guaranteed to happen, of course. As with all integrals, it's about trying things. What I want you to know is the strategy. If you have a line integral of a closed curve, then you can try and find a surface which has that curve as its boundary, and with that surface, you can use Stokes' theorem. After that specific previous example, let me talk a little bit about a general statement. Again, this is about strategy. In the previous example, I used Stokes from left to right. I started with the left side, the line integral of a field. But there are also strategies which start on the right. The right side of Stokes is the flux integral of a curl. So say I have a field F and assume in this case the surface is closed. Recall that a closed surface is a surface which encloses a region um, like a sphere and there is no boundary. Then the left side of Stokes is an integral over a boundary, but if the surface has no boundary, then the integral has to be zero. And this leads to a general statement. If I integrate a curl of a field over a closed surface, that integral will always be zero. This is another strategy to look for. If the field happens to be the curl of something, and if the surface is closed, then by applying Stokes' theorem, the flux must be zero. Let me go back to specific examples now. This parametric surface is a downward paraboloid which sits above the xy plane when taken on the parameter domain of uv in the disk of radius 2. The normal to the surface is outward. What is the boundary of the surface? It's a circle of radius 2 on the xy plane. That's where the edge of the surface is. And since the normal is outward, to match this using a right-hand rule, the circle needs to be oriented counterclockwise. Well, here is a parameterization, a parameterization of the circle going counterclockwise. Hopefully by now this has become a pretty familiar parametric curve. 
That's the geometry. The field I care about here is f of x, y, z equals z squared, x squared, and y squared. And the curl of this field is 2y, 2z, 2x. This is the setup. Say I am starting with a flux integral over the paraboloid of the field 2y, 2z, 2x. I know that field is the curl of capital F. Therefore, the flux integral here on the right side is the right side of Stokes, the flux integral of a curl. Well, then I can turn it into the left side of Stokes, the line integral of the original field over the boundary. I know that boundary, it's a circle. So then I can do the line integral. F of gamma is the field evaluated on the curve. So I replace x with 2 cos t, y with 2 sine t, and z equals 0. The derivatives of the curve are negative 2 sine t, 2 cos t, and 0. I take the dot product and integrate over the parameter domain of the curve from 0 to 2 pi, and the result here is 0. And since the line integral is 0, going back to the other side of Stokes, the original flux integral of the curl was also 0. Again, the main point here is strategy. What was accomplished here? I started with a flux integral, and the field happened to be the curl of something. This is the condition for the right side of Stokes. That means that I can turn it into the left side of Stokes, the boundary and the field before the curl was applied. If I didn't want to do the flux integral over the paraboloid, I could do the line integral over the circle instead, and in this case, that seemed easier to me. Let me move on to examples that use Gauss's theorem. Gauss applies to closed surfaces and solid regions. So here the surface is the sphere of radius 4, which is the boundary of the solid ball of radius 4. The field I want to consider here is f of x, y, z equals 2x cubed, 2y cubed, 2z cubed. Say I want the flux of the field over the sphere. This is the left side of Gauss's theorem, any field and a closed surface. This means that I can go to the right side of Gauss's theorem, the divergence integrated over the solid region. The divergence of this field is 6x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The region is the solid sphere. The right side of Gauss is a triple integral with no parameterization needed. To do this triple integral, I use spherical coordinates, since the region is a solid sphere. In spherical coordinates, x squared plus y squared plus z squared becomes r squared, and I also have r squared sine phi as the Jacobian sort of four spherical coordinates. Then it's just doing the integral, which I haven't shown the steps of here. Again, let me recap the strategy. For any field whatsoever, if the flux integral is over a closed surface, that satisfies the left side of Gauss, and I can switch to the solid region and use the divergence of the field. The triple integral is often easier than the flux integral, since it doesn't have to bother with parameterization issues. Here is another situation. D here is the region inside the cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals 4, starting from height 0, and then up to the slanted plane, x plus y equals 6, or x plus z equals 6, rather. So this is a cylinder with a diagonal upper boundary. Here is the field that I want to consider as well. In cylindrical coordinates, the region is inside radius 2, all around the circle, from 0 to 2 pi, and z from 0 to 6 minus r cos theta, which is the translation of the plane in, into cylindrical coordinates. The field here is a bit complicated, but its divergence happens to be pretty simple. The x derivative of the first component is 2x, the y derivative of the second component is x, and the z derivative of the last component is 0. Therefore, the divergence of the field is 3x. So, all of that said, say I want to consider the flux of this field over the hollow cylinder, including the bottom disk and the top diagonally tilted disk. This is a flux integral over a closed surface, which means that Gauss changes it into a triple integral over a solid region of the divergence of the field. And that divergence I already calculated to be 3x, and I've also already set up the triple integral in cylindrical coordinates. So I've shown the rest of the steps for that triple integral here, but I won't go through them in detail on the video. The strategy here is the same as the previous example. A flux integral over a closed surface turns into a triple integral of the divergence. And this is good because I don't need then to do the parametric description of the cylinder, including that annoying tilted disk at the top, which seems like it would be a fair bit of work to parameterize properly. 
I can do the triple integral instead. Finally, let me end with another general result, this time using Gauss. If I have a flux integral over a closed surface, I can do to the divergence over the region using Gauss. However, if the divergence is zero, then this triple integral will be the integral of zero, which is, of course, zero. Therefore, the integral of any compressible field over a closed surface is zero. And like the general result I did earlier, this is a pretty nice one to know. Look, at, look out for the case where you have a field with zero divergence and a closed surface. Finally, let me do one last recap of the strategy, because strategy is what this whole video is about. For both theorems, I can go in both directions. If I have a line integral over a closed curve, that's the left side of Stokes, and if I can find a surface which has that curve as its boundary, then I can calculate the flux integral of the curl by going to the right side of Stokes. Similarly, if I have a flux integral over any surface, but the field is the curl of something, then I can go from the right to the left of Stokes, and I can go to the line integral over the boundary of the original surface, um, or the boundary of the surface using the original field before applying the curl. If I have a flux integral of any field over a closed surface, I can change it into a triple integral of the region inside the surface by going from the left of Gauss to the right of Gauss. And finally, if I have a triple integral of a scalar field that is the divergence of something, I could change into a flux integral over the boundary um, using the field before the divergence. That said, of the four directions, this last one, Gauss going from right to left, is almost never used. The other three, however, are extremely useful.